we left off the other day with them leaving Lothlorien. And they make their way down the river as they're heading towards Minas Tirith. <clears throat> and when they get to the final place where a decision has to be made, whether to go right or left, right towards Mordor, essentially, and left towards um, Minas Tirith, excuse me, left towards Mordor, right towards Minas Tirith, Frodo says he needs time. So they stop at a place called Parth Galen, and Frodo asks for an hour. Just give me an hour to decide what to do, because they don't really have a leader, so to speak. Aragorn has not taken that mantle upon himself, um, let's say, because he doesn't really know what Gandalf intended at this point. He didn't know if Gandalf intended to go to Mordor with Frodo, uh, but he has already said that he needs to go to Minas Tirith. <clears throat> so Frodo goes off, and after a while, Boromir shows up, and we see Boromir attempt to take the ring, and Frodo puts the ring on and uses it to escape from Boromir. And he runs away, and pages 400, 401. <clears throat> he climbs all the way to the top of this hill, and on the top of it, there's a wide flat circle, we'll we're told, on page 400, paved with mighty flags, that is flagstones and surrounded with a crumbling battlement. And in the middle of this hilltop, there is a seat sitting on these four pillars. And please excuse me, because I'm going to have to blow my nose out because I'm just feeling horrible this morning. <clears throat> and he still has the ring on. So he sits down on this seat, on this big stone chair, and he looks out around him. And he's suddenly able to start making out a lot of different things. Okay? One of the reasons is because he's wearing the ring. Another reason is because he's on Ammon Hin, which means the seat of seed. Okay? This was an ancient stone seat built by the men of Numenor okay? thousands of years previously. And here's what he sees. At first he could see little. He seemed to be in a world of mist in which there were only shadows. The ring was upon him. Then here and there the mist gave way and he saw many visions, small and clear, as if they were under his eyes upon a table, and yet remote. And then it goes on to talk about the hill of the eye of the men of Numenor, etc. He looks eastward. Northward he looks, and the great river lay like a ribbon beneath him, and the misty mountains stood small and hard as broken teeth. He looks westward. He sees the broad pastures of Rowan and Orthanc, the pinnacle of Isengard, like a black spike. That is, he sees Isengard. Even though from a um, this world perspective, there's no way he would physically be able to see Isengard. It's too far away from one, for one thing. And there are actually mountains between Isengard and where he's sitting. All right? Southward he looked, and below his very feet the great river curled like a toppling wave. And he keeps looking. Okay? It's almost like he keeps, and he goes back and forth to these various directions. He looks towards the misty mountains again. And notice, excuse me, the mountains were crawling like anthills, orcs issuing out of a thousand holes. Now, the misty mountains are even farther north than Rivendell is. Okay? And remember, Boromir said he traveled many leagues, took him 110 days. Okay? Rivendell, again, uh, the Misty Mountains are farther north than where Boromir arrived to. And here Frodo sees individual orcs pouring out of the mountains, hundreds of miles away. Under the boughs of Mirkwood, there was deadly strife of elves and men and fell beasts. The land of the Beornings was aflame. A cloud was over Moria. Smoke rose on the borders of Lorien. Horsemen on the grass of Rowan. Wolves pouring out from Isengard, etc. Men moving all over. What is the ring and the 
seat of seeing, allowing him to see. That the enemy is moving across all fronts. Is it just the enemy? The preparation for war that everyone's pushing. The world is at war. That's what he's seeing. There really isn't any peace anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. He sees men on the move. He sees orcs on the move. He sees wolves on the move. All the power of the dark lord was in motion. Then turning south again, he beheld Minas Tirith. Far away it seemed, even though it is closer to him than any of these other places that he has seen. Except for maybe Rome. And beautiful, white-walled, many-towered, proud, and fair upon its mountain seat. Its battlements glittered with steel. Its turrets were bright with many banners. Hope leaped in his heart. Why? Okay, that's one reason. Okay, possible. But he looks at Minas Tirith, and it's strong, and it's proud, and it's got huge battlements, and he's thinking, it'll never fall. It'll never fall. Again, Minas Tirith, against Minas Tirith, was set another fortress. And against here means opposite. So you have Minas Tirith, and then he looks beyond Minas Tirith, and he sees another battlement, greater and more strong, thither eastward, unwilling, his eye was drawn. See, until this point, he'd looked north, south, and west. Now he's looking east. And past the ruined bridges of, of Osculeth, the grinning gates of Minas Morgul, and the haunted mountains, and it looked upon Gorgor the valley of terror in the land of Mordor. Darkness lay there under the sun. How can darkness lay there under the sun? What does Tolkien mean by under the sun? He doesn't mean literally. Here's the land, here's the sun shining, but no light gets down here. He means under the sun like under the circuit of the sun. Everywhere on earth is under the sun, so to speak. But it's only in Mordor that darkness reigns. Fire glowed amid the smoke. Mount Doom was burning, then a great reek rising. Then at last his gaze was held. That is, now he can't stop turning. Wall upon wall, battlement upon battlement, black immeasurably strong, mountain of iron, gate of steel, tower of adamant. He saw it. Baradur, fortress of Sauron. All hope left him. Okay? So first when he turns his eye eastward, he sees Minas Tirith. The, you know, you've heard this phrase a lot in the news lately. This shining city set upon a hill. Literally. Okay? But he sees that, and suddenly his heart's filled with hope. But then his eye's drawn beyond that. And he sees the next, quote-unquote, city, Osculeth. And it's in ruins. And then he sees the Morgul Vale. And it's dark and black, etc. And then he goes even farther, and he sees the land of Mordor in shadow. And then his eye is drawn to Sauron's fortress. And Sauron's fortress makes Minas Tirith looked like a Lincoln Log cabin. Like, and it's gone. All right? And suddenly he felt the eye. The eye that he had seen when he looked into Galadriel's mirror. There was an eye in the dark tower that did not sleep. He knew that it had become aware of his gaze. A fierce, eager will was there. It leaped towards him. Almost like a finger he felt it searching for him. Very soon it would nail him down, know just exactly where he was. It's like, change this to the eye. It's like Frodo is sitting here on this mountain, and the eye is looking, and the eye goes here, and it goes here, and then it goes here, and it goes here, and it's narrowing its focus. Very soon it would nail him down, know just exactly where he was. Amarhla it touched. It glanced upon tall Brandir. He threw himself from the seat. 
crouching, covering his head. And he hears himself cry. Frodo hears his own voice. Never, never. Or, the narrator tells us, was it? Verily I come, I come to you. What is this telling us? Yeah. Frodo is already totally conflicted. Part of him wants to say no to Sauron, and yet part of him, the ring part, wants to say, yes, master. And then he hears another voice. Then as a flash from some other point of power, there came to his mind another thought. Take it off. Take it off. Fool, take it off. Take off the ring. Where does that other thought come from? Who have we seen in the novel so far call other individuals, at least one other individual, a fool? Gandalf. Okay. But from what we know, where is Gandalf at this point? Dead. Dead. Among the unliving, okay? Who else knows Frodo's wearing the ring? Other than, or has the ring, other than the fellowship? Gandalf. And? Galadriel. 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 Okay. Galadriel. What did Galadriel teach Frodo about the ring? When he puts the ring on, who is aware that he has the ring on? All the other ring bearers. All the other ring wearers. Okay. So, from what we know, who has a ring? The Nazgul and Galadriel. Okay, the Nazgul have the nine rings for men. Galadriel is the only one we know of who has one of the three. I'm going to give something away here. By the end of the novel, who else do we know has one of the three? Gandalf. Gandalf. And Elrond. And Elrond. So, Elrond might see it, or it might be Gandalf. Because from what we read later, where is Gandalf really? Possibly by this point. You could say he's possibly laying on top of the mountain. Or you could say he's already back to life and why here the wind lord is taking him to Galadriel. Okay. Or it's possible he is wandering off in lands unknown that he won't tell anybody about. Okay. So there's a couple possibilities as to where this other thought comes from. The two powers strove in him. And finally he takes the ring off. And realizes as a result of that I've got to leave the fellowship. You know, I've, I've got to leave them to protect them. The ring is already working on them. So, he gets ready to leave, and we get taken back to the rest of the fellowship. Now, this is the beginning of, of what Tolkien's going to do with the structure of the novel, where he's going to take where we originally had the fellowship like this, and he's going to take the threads and separate the strands. And we're going to start seeing the fellowship really breaking up. Okay? So that Frodo and Sam are going to go one way. Boromir is going to go off another way that no one else can follow. Uh, Merry and Pippin are going to go off one way. Okay? Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are going to go off another way. Gandalf's already off in his little place. And we're going to see those strands separate, 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 separate. And then in book three... Return of the Kings, they all start to come back together. Okay? So that you end at the very end of the novel, the very last page, it is literally all tied up. Okay? So we go back to the group. They're talking. Sam realizes Boromir is not there. Boromir comes up. He says some things to Aragorn. I saw Frodo, and I don't really want to say anymore. Merry and Pippin run off. We suddenly hear the horn of Boromir. Okay? And the fellowship 
is destroyed seemingly. Now, if you were alive in 1954 and you had just finished this book, you'd have to wait. I think it is five months for the two towers to be published. So Gandalf's dead, and we end up, pick up the next chapter. Aragorn follows Boromir's horn, and he finds Boromir. And Boromir is surrounded, pierced with many black feathered arrows, sword still in his hand, but broken near the hilt. Many orcs lay slain, piled all about him and at his feet. Boromir opens his eyes. I tried to take the ring from Frodo, and I am sorry. I have paid. I have paid. What does he mean? I mean, it's got a literal meaning. It's got a, another meaning. He has suffered for his betrayal. He suffered for his betrayal. He paid for the wrong that he has done. Okay? And he talks about the halflings. They've gone. The orcs have taken them. I think they are not dead. Orcs bound them. Farewell, Aragorn. Go to Minas Tirith. Save my people. I have failed. Now, he thinks he's failed. Why? What is he not able to do? He's not able to continue. Exactly. He can't go back to Minas Tirith and save his people. But he also means I failed. I was tested by the ring. And I lost. The ring won. Okay. Aragorn. No. No, you have not failed. He takes his hand and kisses his brow. You have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. What victory? All the dead orcs around him? Yes, first of all. Aragorn is saying something that should please Boromir, because keep in mind, what motivates Boromir? He's a warrior. Victory and glory, you know, victory in battle. Lots of dead people all stacked around you. He's got that, okay? But it's more than that. Few have gained such a victory. What kind of victory? He was able to acknowledge that he failed the ring's test. Yes. I am sorry I have paid. Okay? Minas Tirith shall not fall. Boromir smiles. And dies. Okay? So, Legolas and Gimli come back. And they have to decide what are they going to do. Okay? They make their way down to the river. They find one of the boats is missing. And a bunch of the others, all of the others, have holes poked in them. Okay? <clears throat> and so they bury... Boromir, they give him a Viking burial. Load him up in the in the one boat that's still good. Set him up there. Put all of his armament and stuff around him, and then all the swords and things of his enemies, and send him off to the river. Okay. And so now Aragorn has to decide what to do. Do we follow Sam and Frodo, or do we follow Mary and Pippa? Sam and Frodo chose to go on their path. Merry and Pippin did not. That is, on the specific path they are now on. So they decided to follow Merry and Pippin. Why? Well, for one reason, they're in the company of orcs. Orcs are flesh eaters. Doesn't really matter what kind of flesh. It could be more orc flesh. Hobbit flesh would probably taste good. Though by now, I bet the hobbits are a little stringy, you know. <laughs> So they go off after Mary and Pippin. And they run and run and run and run and run, following them. Right. Uh, oh, let's see here. I'm going to skip that. Page 428. The fourth morning 
since they begun their chase, begins and Legless wakes them up and says, awake, awake, it is a red dawn. Why? Because he sees smoke off in the distance. Another night comes. Okay. And then they see riders. And because Legolas is an elf, he's got very good sight. And he can count them. He says there are 105, yellow their hair, brighter their spears. Okay. And so the riders are heading towards Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. And Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli just plop down in the grass, pull their cloaks around them, and suddenly look like rocks or something. They blend into the ground. So that as the riders make their way around, suddenly, when almost all 105 riders had gone past them, Aragorn stands up and calls out, What news from the north, riders of Rowan? Page 431. And the riders quickly encircle Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli and pull out their spears and bows. They well, kind of want to know how these <coughs> Yeah, or how they didn't see them, okay? And so one of the writers asks them, who are you? Page 432, Aragorn says, I'm called Strider. Now, why does he say I'm called Strider? Okay. I came out of the north. I'm hunting orcs. And the writer says, at first, I thought you were orcs, and you don't know much about hunting orcs if this is how you hunt orcs. Are you Elvish? Because he says, eh, Strider, that doesn't fit you. In other words, he sees something in Aragorn that doesn't fit that name. And Aragorn says, no, we're not Elvish. One of us is an elf. He kind of points to Legolas. But we have passed through Lothlorien, and the gifts and favor of the lady go with us. Okay, now notice what Aragorn is assuming at that point. What does he assume on the part of the Rohir, the writers of Rowan? That they at least know stories of Lothlorien and the lady. And the writer looks at them with renewed wonder, his eyes hardened. Wonder, but he kind of, you know, squints. Then there is a lady in the Golden Wood. As old tales tell. Okay. Old tales. We've already heard comments in previous chapters about things on the shadows of memory or in the mists of memory. Few escape her nets, they say. These are strange days. But if you have her favor, then you also are net weavers and sorcerers. So, the old stories, the old fairy tales, are true. And because they're true, therefore, she must be, as he puts it, a net weaver. And he looks at her at Legolas and Gimli. Why don't you stop, speak up? Gimli rises. He's been sitting. And plants his feet firmly apart. So that makes him, you know, all of about this tall. Okay, the riders of Rohan are tall, and, on and they're on horseback right now. Okay? And they've got spears and bows and arrows. Gimli stands, give me your name, horse master, and I will give you mine, and more besides. Well, that's not a very polite way to talk to people who are, you know, essentially pointing Uzis at you. <laughs> so, the, so the writer says, as for that, you shouldn't give your name first, but, you know, I'll play your game. I am named Eomer, son of Eomund, and I'm called the third marshal of Rittermark. Then Eomer, son of Eomund, the third marshal of Rittermark, let Gimli the dwarf Glorinson warn you against foolish words. <laughs> now there's a problem here, because here's a dwarf standing up to defend an elf queen. <laughs> you speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought, and only little wit can excuse you. Now, there are an awful lot of put-downs in there, okay? You speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought. 
He's saying, your thought of fairness only goes up this high. <laughs> Galadriel, you know, she's way up here. You're kind of stupid, Elmer. And only little wit, little intelligence, no IQ. Elmer's eyes blazed. The men of Rowan murmured angrily. The horses coming closer. I would cut off your head, beard and all, Master Dwarf, if it stood but a little higher from the ground. If you weren't such a midget and I had to get off my horse in order to hit you. <laughs> and Legolas, he stands not alone. And notice, bending his bow and fitting an arrow with hands that move quicker than sight. So when Legolas, Angel when Legolas says those words before he finishes alone, he has an arrow knock and pointed at Elmer's breast. And you have to imagine the writer going, whoa, <laughs> that sucker's fast. How many can he take up before they kill him? Elmer raises his sword, and Aragorn says, before you kill us, let's talk. Okay? Elmer, fine. Tell me your right name. Aragorn, tell me whom you serve. I'll tell you my, my right name, but first, I need to know what side you are on. Notice the assumption in Aragorn's question. That he'll be honest. That he'll know who he's talking about. Possibly and possibly. What's the other assumption? That his uh, allegiance will fall to the right place. Not necessarily, but your answer has what I'm looking for. He has allegiance to someone. In other words, there is no neutrality here. Tell me whom you serve. Do you serve Sauron or not? Are you friend or foe of Sauron, the Dark Lord of Mordor? I serve only the Lord of the Mark, Theoden, King of King, son of Thangal. And by the way, in case you're interested, Theoden, King. Theoden is the Anglo-Saxon word for king. King, king. Son of the Mark, or son of Thingol. We do not serve the power of the black land. But notice what he says. What do we, the writers of Rowan, or all of the Rohirrim, want out of life? We desire only to be free and to live as we have lived, keeping our own and serving no foreign lord, good or evil. Let the world go blank itself. We just want to be left alone. Okay? Who are you? Whom do you serve? Whose command are you hunting orcs in our land? Aragorn, I serve no man. Well, what does he mean by that? He's not the king. Well, at least he, will be. he could be the king. There are certain things that have to be done first. Okay, what else? He's chief among the Dunedain. He's chief among the Dunedain. What else can that mean? He doesn't grant allegiance to any king or big power. He's a free man. He has no allegiance to anyone over him. Now, I mean, Amir could take this to be like, whoa, <laughs> this guy's dangerous. Like he's an outlaw. I serve no man, but the servants of Sauron what? I pursue into whatever land they may go. I don't care about your little borders. I don't care about international law. I mean, you want to talk applicability? If Aragorn's in Afghanistan, I don't care about the Pakistani border. If some guy's shooting at me and he runs into another country, I'm going to fall him down and I'm going to kill him wherever he goes. That's what Aragorn is saying. Few among mortal men know more of orcs. I do not hunt them in this fashion out of choice. He says, I'm, I was constrained to do this. I'm not weaponless. In other words, I'm not hunting orcs with just, you know, my cloak. I'm going to beat them with it. <laughs> and what does he do? He throws black back his cloak. The elven sheath glittered as he grasped it. So he's got his sheath here. He grasps it. He grasps the hilt of now and Durrell, 
It's got a new name. It was Narso. And he pulls out his sword. And when he pulls it out, he cries, Elendil, I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and am called Elisar, the Elfstone, Dunadin, the heir of Isildur, Elendil, son of Gondor. Here's the sword that was broken and is forged again. Will you aid me or thwart me? Choose swiftly. Okay, now what has he just done to Aomer? Put him in a position where he has to choose Okay, what else has he done? He's just kind of shocked him because he's kind of come out of this fairy tale. Exactly. I mean, he, knight in shining armor just jumped off the page and is now in Aylmer's presence. I mean, listen to the, the naming again. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn. They probably haven't heard of Arathorn. And I'm called Elisar, the Elfstone, Dunadin. They might not be too sure about that, but the heir of Isildur, Elendil, son of Gondor. You can be sure the Rohirrim know who that is. And then he says, this is the sword that was broken. This is the sword that is responsible for the downfall of Sauron. You on my side or not? Gimli and Legolas. Notice we're not told what Elmer experiences first. Gimli and Legolas, who have been with Aragorn for a long time now, look at their companion in amazement, for they had not seen him in this mood before. He seemed to have grown in stature while Aramir had shrunk. And in his living face, they caught a brief vision of the power and majesty of the kings of stone. The kings of stone, Isildur and Elendil, as they were making their way down the river, just before they got to Parth Galen, they see these huge statues, hundreds of feet tall. Get on the internet, I think you can find it on the internet, and look for the illustration by... Greg and Tim Hildebrandt, a couple of artists who back in the 70s and early 80s did a lot of Tolkien calendar illustrations. And it is fantastic of um, the statues of Isildur and Elendil. And we're told, and for a moment it seemed to the eyes of Legolas that a white flame flickered on the brows of Aragorn like a shining crown. What's the white flame? Elfstone is one of his names. Well, what's the elf stone? Silver. Because he is the descendant of Erendil, the guy who's been turned into a star. Doo -doo -doo. You know, I mean, that's just kind of out of this world, literally. Elmer steps back, and what does he do? He steps back, and he looks down. These are indeed strange days. It's like he can't even look in Aragorn's face. Dreams and legends spring to life out of the grass. All right? Well, so there is a lady in the golden wood. That much the old stories tell. Tell me, Lord. Notice, tell me, Lord. Is that like, tell me, sir? No. no. What does Lord mean? Master. He's acknowledging Aragorn's supremacy over even him, even though he's not a man of Gondor. Tell me, Lord, what was the meaning of the dark words? That is, I know the words that Boromir brought to Rivendell. What doom do you bring out of the north? He's kind of thinking, great. There's the end of our way of life. What doom do you bring out of the north? The doom of choice. Why is choice a doom? Because you have to decide whether or not you end the way you've always been so far. Well, possibly. But you have to choose. And what is every choice? It's a judgment call. It's a judgment call. Every choice you make, do you know 100% what the consequences of that choice will be? Of course not. Okay? 
You may say this to Thad and son of Thingol. Open wars lie be open war lies before him. Okay. Say this to your uncle. You must choose. Right? Aragorn says, I myself, I'm going to come to the king, but we're looking for some friends. Have you found them? And they talk a little bit. And one of the writers, when Gimli says they're halflings, one of the writers, halflings, halflings? They are only a little people in old songs and children's tales out of the north. Do we walk in legends or on the green earth in the daylight? Now, you think Aragorn ought to walk up to him and smack him upside the head and say, Hello, legend, fairy tale, walking. <laughs> a man may do both. That is, a man may walk in legends or on the green earth in daylight. How? For not we, but those who come after will make the legends of our time. In other words, our lives, our actions, our behaviors might become the stuff of legend. Now, not just, you know, getting your car, going to class, going home, that kind of thing. But, you know, those 400 or some New York firefighters who raced to the Twin Towers. That has become, quote unquote, legendary. I mean, gut reaction is run away, run away. <laughs> they ran too. They went up the burning buildings. Okay? Scott Beamer and the guys on Flight 93. That has become legendary. The green earth, you say? That is a mighty matter of legend, though you tread it under the light of day. That's Tolkien's way of telling the reader. The natural world around you is not something to be missed. It is something to be seen anew every day. And the writer, notice, not heeding Aragorn, says, time's pressing. Hey, we got to go. He's, he's not paying any attention. If you want, you could say, this guy's a Vernon Dursley. Anything out of the ordinary, put it away. Elmer, peace, Elthane. So Elmer and Aragorn talk some more. They talk about Gandalf. They talk about Gandalf taking shadow facts, and how that didn't really sit right, etc., They keep talking. They talk about the hobbits. And page 437 at the bottom. Aragorn says, I can't come with you yet because I have to make sure I cannot desert my friends while help remains. Elmer, there's no hope. There weren't any hobbits. We burned them all. We burned all the orcs. Okay. And he says, yeah, but they were dressed like us. <laughs> you rode right past us. Middle of 438. Aragorn says, our friends were attired even as we, and you passed us by under the full light of day. I'd forgotten that, Elmer replies. It's hard to be sure of anything among so many marvels. In other words, he's saying, my reality has gotten a little bit shaken here. I don't really know what is true anymore. Well, the world is all grown strange. Elf and dwarf and company walk in our daily fields. That would be like Jesse Jackson and, you know, the Grand Wizard of the KKK walking hand in hand down the street singing Kumbaya, you know. <laughs> And folk speak with the lady of the wood and yet live. And the sword comes back to war that was broken in the long ages ere the fathers of our fathers rode into the mark. How shall a man judge what to do in such times? Everything is turned on its head. How do I know what is right and what is wrong? As he ever 
has judged. Aragorn says, good and ill have not changed since yesteryear. Aragorn is an absolutist. And by that I mean for Aragorn, good is good. It is not 99% good with a little bit of bad mixed in. It's not just varying shades of gray, but you have complete total white and complete total black. Good, evil. Nor are they one thing among elves and dwarves and another among men. What is good for elves, guess what, is also good for dwarves and men. Tol uh, Aragorn, through Tolkien, is also not a relativist. He doesn't say, hey man, it's my own truth and I get to do what I want, man. I smoke some weed and go off and, you know. He's not like that. Okay? It is a man's part to discern them. That is, you want to be a man, Aylmer? You got to decide what is right and wrong. And you have to do it as much in the golden wood, the perilous realm, fairyland, as in your own home. In other words, wherever you are, wherever you are placed, you have to determine right from wrong. Yeah, yeah, true indeed. I, I don't doubt you, but I'm not free to do as I wish. Why not? Because he serves the king. Because he serves the king. He is under the orders of the king. And he says, my law says, you cannot let strangers wander in the land of the royal here. If I do, I will face the consequences of the law. Aragorn says, I understand. But your law was not made for this situation. Nor indeed am I a stranger. I've been in this land before, more than once, ridden with the host of the royal here. I've not seen you before, for you're young, but I have spoken with Elm and your father, and with Ed and son of Thingol. Okay? So he says, your choice is clear. You either have to kill us, or let us go. Because he's kind of saying, we're not going to Theoden now. we got to make sure our friends are safe. So, Elmer says, all right, I'll let you go. I'll even give you three horses, or two horses, etc." So they make their way, they go to the edge of Fangorn Forest, they camp out, Aragorn tells uh, Gimli, don't worry about firewood, you don't want to touch the trees of this forest. Then they see an old man, okay, and then what does Tolkien do? He leaves them. So the book opens with Frodo and Sam going one way, Merry and Pippin going one way, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli going one way, and Gandalf is still dead. Okay? So we follow Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. Now we go and follow Merry and Pippin. When do we follow Frodo and Sam? Book four, okay, second half of the two towers, okay. So we follow Mary and Pippin. We see their interactions with the Urukai and such. I'm skipping a bunch. We see them escape, and they make their way into Fangorn. They go on into the wood. After they escape from the orcs, and they find a hill. They climb up to the hill and they look down around them. And we get this description on page 463. Mary says, the wind's changing. It's turned east again. It feels cool up here. Pippin, yes. I'm afraid this is only a passing gleam and it will all go gray again. What a pity. This shaggy old forest looks so different in the sunlight. I almost felt I liked it. Almost felt you liked the forest. That's good. That's uncommonly kind of you. Okay. The voice for um, 
Fangorn, Treebeard, Tolkien says in his letters, um, he imagined it being C.S. Lewis's voice. C.S. Lewis had a deep, booming voice when he would lecture and, and such. Okay? And they turn around, they feel these big, gnarly hands, turn them around, and they're looking at a tree, essentially, talking to them. And they find out the tree's name, and the tree essentially says, I'm Treebeard, I'm also called Fangorn. That is, the entire forest is named for him. Why? Because he's the oldest of the imps. It's sort of like his realm. Yeah. He's the daddy, so to speak, of all of the walking, talking trees, or the shepherds of the trees. So they talk. And page 466, um, Mary asks, did you know Gandalf? He says, yes, I do know him. Mary asked, did you know Gandalf? I do know him. The only wizard that really cares about trees. Notice present tense. Do you know him? Yes, we did. He was a great friend and he was our guide. He says, but you speak about Master Gandalf as if he was in a story that came to an end. All throughout the book, this emphasis about being in a story. And they talk about Gandalf falling out of it and such. So they continue talk, talking and they talk about Saruman and all this other kind of stuff. And Treebeard takes him to his house. And he gives them int draft, like int beer, right? And by the end of the novel, they grow like a foot because they're drinking int food or int draft, etc. And they continue talking about Saruman and such, and Treebeard gets rather upset. And he orders an int moot or calls an int moot. Mary and Pippin get taken off with Bregalad and such. And we hear by the end of the chapter, chapter Treebeard, that they're marching to Isengard. The Ents have decided they finally, they're going to rise up, they're going to do something. And they make their way, and the chapter ends with night over Isengard. I'm trying to get through as much of this as I can. So we pick up with chapter 5, the White Rider. Notice, we start here, we go off here, we're going back here. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. And they look at the ground and they realize there are footprints. Okay. And the footprints lead them into the forest. Page 491. Now, remember, they had, they had camped under the eaves of the forest, just on the outer edge. Now they're going into the forest itself. <clears throat> and on page 491, just before the middle of the page, um, they're talking about Fangorn and the forest. And Legolas says it is old, very old, so old that almost I feel young again as I have not felt since I journeyed with you children. Now the impression is that Legolas is kind of young. And I don't remember if it says in the appendices, but he apparently is several hundred years old. If he can call Aragorn children. Um, it is old and full of memory. I could have been happy here if I'd come in days of peace. Gimli, I dare say you could. You are a wood elf anyway, though elves of any kind are strange folk. You comfort me. Where you go, I will go. If you're familiar with the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, okay, Ruth says to Naomi, or the other way around, whither thou goest, I will go. The daughter-in-law says to the mother-in-law after the husband is killed. Okay? So they make their way into the forest. And they see an old man in white off to the side. And Gimli's like, kill him! Shoot him! 
And Legolas says, I can't shoot him. Don't even know who he is or anything. All right? And Aragorn, bottom of 492, says, We may not shoot an old man so at unawares and unchallenged. Whatever fear or doubt be upon us. Okay? Be not too eager to deal out death and judgment. Everyone's like, we can't shoot first and ask questions. Later. <laughs> so the old man quickens his pace, comes to the foot of the rock wall, and he says to them, well met, my friends. Will you come down or I sh shall I come up? Okay. He tells Legos to put down his bow and he drops it. And they talk. Everyone asks, what's your name? And the man says, haven't you guessed it yet? Bottom of 494. The old man turns, sits down at the heap of stones. The others relax. Gimli's hand goes to his axe. Aragorn draws his sword. Legolas picks up his bow. The old man doesn't notice. But they notice when he moves, his gray cloak kind of opens up a little bit, and they see white underneath. Saruman! The old man was too quick for him. He sprang to his feet and leaped to the top of a large rock. There he stood, grown suddenly tall, towering above them. His hood and his gray rags were flung away. His white garment shone. He lifted up his staff, and Gimli's axe and leaped from his grasp and fell ringing on the ground. The sword of Aragorn, stiff in his motionless hand, blazed with the sudden fire. Don't know whether that means it literally, whoosh, you know. Legolas gave a great shout, shot an arrow high into the air, it vanished in a flash of flame. Mithrandir, the elvish name for Gandalf. And Frodo's like, uh, Aragorn's like, why couldn't I see you? At last, Aragorn stirred. Gandalf, beyond all hope, you return to us in our need. Now, if you read the fairy story essay, this is an example of a eucatastrophe. Tolkien defines a eucatastrophe as a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur. Okay? You never expected Gandalf to come back from the dead. You pretty much can't expect it to happen again. As an example, nowhere in the New Testament do we find out somebody dies, Jesus raises them from the dead, they die again and he does it again. You know, they don't get do-overs. It's kind of a one-time shot. Gandalf, Gandalf, yeah, that was my name, that's right. Gimli, but you're all in white. I thought Saruman, you know, it was Gimli's... Um, he thought, he would have realized that Saruman was now Saruman the Colorful. Yeah, but when Gandalf first looked at him, he's looked all white, but when he moved and we really looked, then he noticed he kind of shimmered. Yes, I am white now. I am Saruman, one might almost say, as he should have been. Okay? There's an implication here. Notice what has happened to Gandalf. He went from being gray to white. He progressed. He improved. You could say he evolved. I passed through fire and deep water. I've forgotten much that I thought I knew, learned much again that I had forgotten. Okay? So they talk. They tell Gandalf uh, what's been going on with them. Aragorn says, you still speak in riddles? Because, on page 496, Gandalf says, you've not told me everything. Talks about Boromir. And he says, it was not in vain that the young hobbits came with us, if only for Boromir's sake. What? That is, if the hobbits didn't come for any other reason, their coming was good for Boromir. Why? Gave him the cause to redeem himself. He died trying to save them. He sacrificed himself for them. That's the victory that Boromir won. Okay? 
But that is not the only part they have to play. They were brought to Fangorn, and their coming was like the falling of small stones. They start an avalanche in the mountains. And they're like, what are you talking about? Well, what other part did they play? Later. Pippin drops the stone into the well, wakens the Balrog. Balrog kills Gandalf. Gandalf goes off. Gandalf comes back. He's white. Okay? A lot of other stuff. Exactly. So they continue talking. And page 499. Uh, Gimli brings up the old man that they saw. Gandalf says, no, it wasn't me. Legless then asks, where are the hobbits? Gandalf with Treebeard and the Ents. Aragorn, the Ents? And there's truth in the old legends about the dwellers in the deep forest and the giant shepherds of the trees? It's like, <laughs> Aragorn, it seemed like just 20 minutes ago you were telling Aomer about the truth of the old legends and fairy stories. Are there still Ents in the world? I thought they were only a memory of ancient days. <laughs> if indeed, they were ever more than a legend of Rowan. Like, legend? Nay, every elf in Wilderland has sung songs of the Onodrim and their long sorrow. If I were to meet one still walking in this world, then indeed I should feel young again. More legends, stories from the past, popping up into view. Okay? Gandalf. When Legolas says, but Treebeard, that's only a rendering of Fangorn into the common speech. Who is this Treebeard? Treebeard is Fangorn, guardian of the forest. He is the oldest of the Ents, the oldest living thing that still walks beneath the sun upon this middle earth. Well, that doesn't jive with something we heard earlier. Because Tom, Tom Bombadil says, eldest I am. I was here before the sun, because in Tolkien's creation of the world, when the world was flat, the sun didn't exist. But he specified that Treebeard is the oldest living thing. You could imply that, tree, that Tom Bombadil is exactly living, he's just existing. Yeah, it could be that Tom, Tom Bombadil lives on another plane, or that still walks beneath the sun. So possibly Tom Bombadil left for vacation. No, exists simultaneously in two places, or is everywhere present and fills all things. <laughs> okay. So they continue talking, and Gimli says, "But you speak of Fangorn as as though he's dangerous." Gandalf says, "He is, and so am I, and so is Aragorn, and so is Legolas, and so are you." Okay. So they continue talking, and Gandalf says, we need to go see Theoden. They want to see the hobbits. He says, not yet, not yet. All right, skipping a bunch again. And they ask about what happened. How, how did you fare with the Balrog? He says, don't name him. You know, he must not be named, so to speak. And Gandalf tells us on page 502, Towards the middle of the page, I threw down my enemy, and he fell from the high place and broke the mountainside where he smote it in his ruin. That is almost an exact um, translation, let's say, putting into Tolkien ease of it's either Ezekiel or Daniel, where Satan is cast out of heaven and hits the earth. That description is given about his fall. Then darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time, and I wandered far on roads that I will not tell. Naked I was sent back for a brief time until my task is done. Now, a few scholars have written about that and wondered, does that mean physically he did not have clothes on when he was sent back, or naked he was unbodied? And he had to receive a new body. 
and naked I lay upon the mountaintop. The tower behind was crumbled into dust. Da, 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 da. Why here the wind lord comes, takes him back to Galadriel, etc. Okay? And so when he mentions Galadriel, he says, I have messages for you. And he speaks to Aragorn first. And she alludes to the paths of the dead. She speaks to Legless and says, Beware the sound of the sea. And Kim was like, She sent me no message. Page 503. Legless, yeah, but her words aren't good. You don't want any Gimli. That's no comfort. What? Would you ever speak openly to you of your death? Yes. Even if she had nothing else to say. Gandalf, huh, what's that? He's acting like Tom Bombadil. <laughs> oh, yeah, she did have something for you, Gandalf, uh, Gimli. To Gimli, son of Glowen, she said, give his ladies greeting. His ladies. <laughs> his ladies greeting. Lock bearer. Wherever thou goest, my thought goes with thee. Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> Wherever Gimli goes... Galadriel's thinking about him. Why? He cares, carries hairs from her head. The implication is that the hairs are almost like physical representations of her thought, her concern. But have a care to lay thine axe to the right tree. Now listen to Gimli. In happy hour you have returned to us, Gandalf. <laughs> Cried the dwarf, capering as he sang loudly in the strange dwarf tongue. Come, come, he shouted, swinging his axe. I need something to kill. <laughs> and he's capering, he's dancing. All right? Gimli's infatuated. There's no other way to put it. So they make their way to Adaras. And... Hold on just one second. Uh, trying to find a passage from an old English poem that these lines are from. On page 508, where you have Aragorn read, where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the halberd and the bright hair flowing, etc.? In an old English poem called The Wanderer, there is a passage towards the end where you have what's called the ubisunt motif, which means where are. Ubisunt means where are in Latin. And in this poem, The Wanderer, the speaker is lamenting the transitoriness of life on earth. That everything falls, everything dies, everything rots, everything decays. And in this one passage, the speaker says, Where qua marg? Where qua mago? Excuse me. Where qua maudum yiva? Where qua simbla yisetu? Where sendin sella dramas? Eala bircht buna, eala birnwiga, eala thadness thrim, who said and he goes on, etc. In the film, where we see Aragorn do this, they put these lines in Old English. Okay, so that he is reciting this in Anglo-Saxon. Okay. So they make their way to Adaros, and they're told to leave their weapons outside, and everybody does but Gandalf. Yeah, I'm an old man. I need my stick. No. 
And they go in and they get challenged by Grima. And in Adaros, in the hall, that is sold. The hall is dark. And Metacell, if you're looking at it from the end, it would look somewhat like this, okay? Right in the middle of the floor, there would be a fire. There would be seats over here or benches over here, benches over here. And maybe, you know, Thayden would have a higher seat, et cetera, where he would sit at, okay? And we're told in this description that there are only a couple of windows up here. There's a hole up here for the smoke to rise out of. And so it's dark and dusty. And Gandalf points to one of the windows and says, Do you ask for help? Not all is dark. Take courage, Lord of the Mark. For better help you will not find. No counsel have I to give to those that despair. And Theoden rises out of his chair. This is after Gandalf has already zapped, you know, uh, Wormtongue. And he doesn't want to talk to you. So Theoden gets up. They go to the doors. They open the doors. And Gandalf takes Theoden off, off onto the porch. And he looks outside. And we get this beautiful description. Page 515 towards the bottom. From the porch upon the top of the high terrace, they could see beyond the stream. They could see beyond the stream the green fields of Rowan fading into distant gray. Curtains of wind-blown rain were slanting down. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder, and lightning far away flickered among the tops of the hidden hills. But the wind had shifted to the north, and already the storm that had come out of the east was receding, rolling away southward to the sea. Suddenly, <coughs> through a rent in the clouds behind them, a shaft of sun stabbed down. The falling flowers gleamed, showers gleamed like silver, and far away the river glittered like a shimmering glass. So the sky is overcast, and suddenly, a little hole breaks through, shaft of sunlight. Okay? This is a visual eucatastrophe. This is a visual way of showing evil will not ultimately win. Theoden. It's not so dark here. Gandalf. No, nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders. As some would have you think. Cast aside your prop. He throws his stick down. Notice what Theoden does not do. Or let me rephrase that. Notice what Gandalf does not do to Theoden. Sermon, come forth! You know, he doesn't point his stick at him and, you know, have Theoden do all that and exercise him. O-R-C-I-S-E, okay? Saruman is not controlling Theoden. Why was Theoden the way he was? Because his counsel had made him such a problem. Yes. He was depressed. His mind made him that way. He listened to the words of Wormtongue, and he believed it. Okay? Is this just a fancy thing? No. What happens if somebody tells you something all the time? What do you start to do? Believe it. Believe it. So if you're told from the moment you take a breath of, of air that you're a worthless, no good piece of garbage, and your parents tell you that all through until you're a teenager, what more than likely is your life going to be like from that point on? Pretty bad. You're not going to give a rip for anything or anyone. Okay? On the other hand, if you're told that you're loved, you're valuable, you're worthwhile, you could do whatever you want in the world, okay? I mean, within physical reason, then you're going to have a certain amount of confidence in your life, etc. And so what does he do? He throws the stick down, and we're told he, tall, he stands tall and straight, and his eyes are blue. Dark have been my dreams of late, but I feel as one new awakened. If you read the fairy story essay, what has 
Theoden just experienced recovery. He is seeing as he was meant to see. I would now that you would come before Gandalf. Would there means, he's, Tolkien is using it in the old English sense. It means wished, I desired. Why? Because he thinks the time's too late. We've wasted too much time. Gandalf says, no, not really. You know what would make even better, Theoden? If you had a sword in your hand. Why? Because he is a warrior. He's a warrior. Warriors need to die with their swords in their hands. Okay? And he says, page 517, Alas, that these evil days should be mine, and should come in my old age instead of the peace which I have earned. Alas for Boromir the brave, the young perish and the old linger withering. He's saying, it's not right. Boromir should be alive. I should be dead. Gandalf, you'd feel stronger if you held your sword. So, Aomer brings his sword. And then Wormtongue finally speaks. I, I care about you, etc. So what option does he give one tongue? Stay and die or go. Prove yourself. Prove your loyalty. You can march with me to war, or you can go off, even if you want to go back to Saruman. And what does he do? He spits at Theoden and leaves. Notice what we don't really see in here that we see in the film. Yeah, don't bring him down the stairs. Okay. So what him. else? About Aragorn and somebody else. There's nothing going on here between Aragorn and Eowyn. There's no flirting. No, oh, will you come sharpen my sword? No, you know, oh, I'll be your sword mistress, you know. There's none of that nonsense, okay? No Aragorn having, you know, dreams about Arwen and... Um, okay, so they keep talking. And we get chapter 7, Helm's Deep. Okay. The chapter is only 16 pages long. The actual battle... At Helm's Deep is only nine pages long in the entire book, The Two Towers. And yet in the film, it's about a fourth to a third. About 45 minutes. Out of a slightly over two hour movie, if I remember right. Or is it three hours? Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever actually finished it, so. But it's long, okay? Why doesn't Tolkien spend much time at the Battle of Helm's Deep? It's not really about the struggle. It's, it's not all that important. Tolkien is not interested in showing us how people get killed and slaughtered. Because he's been there, he knows. Which Peter Jackson is. Okay? Because he's been there, he knows. The, the battle in the story <laughs> is a moral battle. Much more than it is physical. We're going to see that at, towards the end, just before they march on Mordor, with some things that Gandalf is going to tell everybody about how they're going to win if they win. Okay? So, they go on to Helm's Deep. <coughs> and, it's like, I don't even want to say much about that. And we have the little, you know, contest between Legolas and Gimli. <laughs> Oh, notice, by the way, what else we don't have? Dwarf tossing. Okay. <laughs> it's cute and funny. It's cute and funny. Okay. Uh, so Gandalf comes and arrives at just the right moment. We get the road to Isengard. We see the Hjorns eat <laughs> the orcs and such. Um... Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
And let's see here. Flotsam and Jetsam. They meet up with er uh, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. Meet up with Merry and Pippin. <coughs> they hear about their story. Okay. They talk about the downfall of Isengard. So Tolkien uses this chapter <coughs> to give us the exposition we need to understand how it happened. Okay. And then we come to the voice of Saruman. Oh, excuse me. And Gandalf says, I've got to go talk to Saruman. Treebeard needs to come. Theoden needs to be there. Aragorn needs to be there. The rest of you should stay here. Gimli says, I want to go. Well, why? Because I want to see if he's like you. <laughs> if he wants you to see him like me, that's what you'll see. Kind of, you know, whatever. You come. So, Gandalf goes to Orthanc and he commands Gim, uh, Grima to bring Saruman out. And Saruman comes out. I think I've got just enough time to do this. The Saruman speaks. And we get a long description on page 578 about how his voice sounds and all that kind of stuff. And then we actually hear the words that he speaks. <clears throat> Why must you disturb my rest? Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? And all the riders look up and they're like, <coughs> like and yet unlike, Gimli says. And then Saruman addresses Theoden. But come now. Two at least of you I know by name. Gandalf I know too well to have much hope that he seeks help or counsel here. But you, Theoden, Lord of the Mark of Rowan, are declared by your noble devices, and still more by the fair countenance of the house of Aeorl, O worthy son of Thango, the thrice renowned, blah, 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 blah. blah. Theoden opens his mouth as if to speak, doesn't say anything. Gandalf just sits still. What do the writers think? Murmuring with approval the words of Saruman. Gandalf had never spoken like that to their master. Okay? Gimli speaks. So we have Saruman's first appeal to Theoden. Gimli breaks the spell. The words of this wizard stand on their heads in the language of Orthanc. Help means ruin. And saving means slaying that is plain. In other words, it's like Saruman has read... 1984, <laughs> because he uses doublespeak. War is peace, okay? Ignorance is knowledge. Peace! And for a fleeting moment, his voice was less suave, and the light flickered in it. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli Glowen, son. Far away is your house, and you've been mighty blah, blah, blah. What have you to say? Theoden King, his second appeal. Will you have peace with me and all the aid that my knowledge founded in long years can bring? Still Theoden doesn't answer. Amir chimes in, though. Lord, hear me. Now we feel the peril that we were warned of. Have we ridden forth to victory only to stand at last, amazed by an old liar with honey on his forked tongue? He keeps talking, and notice his Parting words to Theoden, what he really wants to draw his attention to. Remember Theodred at the fords. Theodred is Theoden's son. Remember the grave of Hama in Helm's Deep. Well, what did they do to Theodred at the fords? They hacked and hewed his body into pieces. What did they do to the grave of, what did they do to Hama? They hacked and hewed him into pieces. When you kill somebody, you're supposed to leave them. That's it. You don't then hack them into little pieces of meat. If we speak of poison tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? Whoa. Kind of losing his cool there. And then he, oh, sorry. Didn't mean that. And how does he address Amir? What is Amir's job? 
<laughs> Valor in arms is yours, and you win high honor thereby. Slay whom your Lord names as enemies, and be content. In other words, Amir, be a gun. Be a weapon. That's all you're supposed to do. Follow orders. Meddle not in policies which you do not understand. Maybe if you become king, you'll find that a king must choose his friends with care. That's the language of diplomats. All right? And I think Tolkien, frankly, had had enough of it. <laughs> because it was diplomats that started, essentially, World War I, with all of the alliances that were created. Saruman goes for a third try. But, my lord of Rowan, am I to be called a murderer? And notice what he does. Because valiant men have fallen in battle. Notice, he's equating men dying in battle with murder. If you go to war needlessly, for I do not desire it, then men will be slain. You started the war, Theoden, not me, is what he's saying. But if I am a murderer on that account, then all the house of Aeoral is stained with murder. He is saying, because my troops killed your troops in battle, therefore you are saying I am a murderer. Well, if that's true, then you are a murderer. This is called moral equivalency. Okay? And finally, Theoden replies, we will have peace. Several of the writers cry out, we will have peace. We will have peace. Takes them three times to get it out. When you and all your works have perished, and the works of your dark master to whom you would deliver us, you are a liar, sir man, and a corrupter of men's hearts. Even if your war on me was just. And he brings in an Augustinian notion named after St. Augustine, a saint in the Catholic Church, who first put forth the theory of just war. Google just war theory. And there are several qualifications involved. Okay? For example, it has to be defensive. It cannot be offensive. It cannot go after civilians. Okay? Even if your war on me is just, as it was not, even so, what will you say of your torches in Westfold and the children that lie there? In other words, he attacked a hamlet. He wiped out women and children. No military objective. And, there, and what about Hama's body before the gates of the Hornburg? After he was dead. No, we'll have peace. When you hang from a gibbet at your window for the sport of your own crows. And then Sarah Man just loses it. Just loses all control. Okay. We'll pick up. Got almost where I wanted to get. We'll pick up with 581. If you came in late, make sure you sign.